Hello, everyone. Yeah. It's really wonderful to see this diverse group of people. Yeah. <laughs> that word. <laughs> really wonderful to see you. So my name is Isabel Espinal. I'm a librarian here. I'm the librarian for uh, many subjects, uh, Latin American, Caribbean, and Latinx studies. And the Center for Latin American, Caribbean, and Latinx studies is a co-sponsor. I'm also the librarian for Native American and Indigenous Studies, for Afro-American Studies, and for Women, Gender, Sexuality Studies, and for Spanish and Portuguese. So All you're, of you're this. You're the utility lady. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like half the world, uh, not Asia or the Middle East, but mm -hmm. um, all of these studies are embodied in our speaker today. In, in many ways. No pressure here. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, by any of that. So, um, Marinel and I actually go way back. We're, we we have a friendship as well as a professional relationship that goes back um, longer than many of you have been alive. <laughs> we met in the early nineties, and here is the director of the Center uh, of Latin American Caribbean Latin Studies, Stephanie Feta. Uh, thank you so much for coming. The center has been busy with so many events, so I really appreciate the sponsorship and the presence of the center. Um, so a little bit about Marinela. Marinela Medrano was born and raised in the island of Quisqueya, also known as Haiti, in the country today called the Dominican Republic. She has lived in Connecticut since 1990, an Afro-Taina poet and a writer of nonfiction and fiction. She holds a PhD in psychology, a professional counselor's license, and certification as a poetry therapist. She has researched and written many publications about Taino heritage and has also served as an educator for her people. I include, I include myself. She's educated me a lot. Um, her work and writings on Taino culture include her 2007 doctoral dissertation, Empowering Dominican Women, the Divine Feminine in Taino Spirituality. Her books, Diosas de la Yuca and Rooting, which we have today, so you can, after the talk and the discussion, um, you can purchase a book and have it signed by Marianela. Uh, Diosas de la Yuca is in Spanish only, and the other one is bilingual. Um, and, um, and other writings, and she has a wonderful TED talk called Asiguapa Speaks on how I came to value wholeness, which I also recommend. Um, so she writes, the name of my birthplace is Cope, which in Taino or Arawak language means flower. It was in Cope where the seeds of my academic work were first planted. There I was drawn to the way of my ancestors, inscribed in day-to-day -day social practices, and even in our childhood games and backyard expeditions, where we would dig out the Inu ceramics that we used as our toys, unknowingly touching a part of the fabric of who we were as a people. So this goes very deep, and um, I would let Marinela continue uh, the journey with you. Thank you so much, Marinela. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's always a pleasure for me to engage in this topic. Um, and also to share my poetry. Um, so, where do I begin? Let's begin with a question for you. In most indigenous traditions, when someone feels ill or feels uneasy, there are some questions that are thrown at them. And one of the questions is, when did you stop singing? When did you stop dancing? When did you stop being enchanted by the mystery of stories? So I have those three questions for you. When did you stop dancing? When did you stop singing? When did you stop being enchanted by the mystery of stories? I do want an answer. Oh. I'm not just throwing a question there. What are some answers? 
What do you hear? And seriously, these are questions when people come to a medicine person feeling perhaps depressed or physically ill. These questions are given to them before anything else. So what are some answers? What is that? Middle school. In middle school, what did you do? You stopped dancing? Yeah. Have you gone back? Yeah. Good. Good, good, good. Thank you. What other answers? When did you stop singing? When did you stop dancing? When did you stop being enchanted by stories? Ah, we have someone here <laughs> who have not stopped. I have not stopped. That's important. <laughs> Do you know what have kept you in that place? Yeah, it it, it feeds my soul. Mm. It's it's it fills voids. Mm. Um, it's it, no one really dances sad. Mm. So yeah. when you're sad, you dance, and then you're not sad. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. So, that's true. Um, yeah, I'll be above. Maria del Carmen. Maria del Carmen Rodriguez. Yes, <laughs> beautiful. Thank you. How about you? Did you stop dancing? Did you stop believing in stories? No. No, you're still believing in them. Good. Good. Come on. Don't be stingy. Give me your answers, <laughs> yes? Well, I remember at one point I stopped singing. Uh -huh. I had just become a mom uh -huh. a few years prior, and when my son could speak, my voice was so horrible, he asked me not to sing in <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny now. Um, but at the time, you know, I was a little crestfallen. It was this yeah. thing I wanted to share with them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you stopped. I needed a few voice lessons first. Yeah, <laughs> but you recovered it. Yes. Okay, good, yes. good. The was the hand here, Louis? I think for me it's just like a psychic thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I can find my voice mm -hmm. sometimes I can. Mm -hmm. And I I derive a lot of um, power from both singing and dancing. Mm -hmm. um, but I only pressure myself when I'm really happy with what the artist is doing it. Yeah. So you're compassionate with yourself and you wait until you can go back. Smart person. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I don't know if I have been more like your dad. Uh -huh. but, but I think it was probably around the time I started becoming more aware of like how my own voice was being or like how other people judged or perceived uh -huh. our actions. Which I think uh -huh. was like right around like when I started middle school. Yeah. I know that's when I stopped dancing. Um it's that gaze, right? The outside gaze that makes us, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing that. Because it was that outside gaze that stopped me too. The fear of not being okay. Yeah. Which for most of us happens around, uh, you know, middle school, high school. That's where all the trouble begins. But what is important, the reason I like asking the, these questions, and I ask in everywhere I go, is because what I want to do is to plant the seed that if you had stopped doing any of these three things, you can go back at your own pace, as you say. No pressure, right? But at, your, at our own pace, find our way back to that. Um, one of the things that I also invite people to think is that we all, and I was talking to um, some of you earlier today, we all come from what I call a big history, right? We have a, a large history behind us. In my case, my big history is that I was born in an island, that the Taino people and uh, the Korean people lived there, and then we were colonized, and the colonizers did a lot of damage, 
and dwindle the population. And the emphasis is in dwindle because we were not um, extinct. And that was a myth that was propagated. Or still, you still find books that says Tainos were extinct. And my dissertation was about doing away with that nonsense. How can you do away with them? People, you can transform cultures, you can do things to silence certain things, but you cannot kill a people. So my big history was that, and then they went to Africa and they brought slaves, they forced people, and it was a traveling genocide, right? That was um, intercontinental. So that's the big history, right? What was the message of that big history? It was like, you're not okay. Your people are stupid, you're savage, right? So as a little kid, I began shrinking, shrinking and folding until something woke me up and I began putting together my personal story. And the personal story was, I belong. And I think I, that was to, to being part of a very loving family and a mother who was tied, merged to the earth. And that has force. My mom lived, she's turning 90. No, today she turned 90. Aww. Yay, Mama! I spoke with her for a little bit, and then we have a big party for her on the 18. It's like the whole world is going there. But she was someone like really merged with the earth, who believed in the power of herbs who had 12 children at home. She refused to go to a hospital. She refused to let modern medicine touch her body, right? So that has power. And, you know, little by little, I remember that. And I created my personal story, right? So I'm saying these, to invite you to think, what's the big history that has been told to me as this is who I am? And what's my personal story? And I was saying three very important uh, men in the history. Um, one from India, Krishnamurti, Thomas Merton, who was a, a Christian myth. Um, what is it that I'm trying to say? Let's say a Christian sage and a contemporary philosopher of this country, Ken Wilber. They, the three of them call our attention to this. When you are telling your story, when you are speaking, is it your voice or is it the voice of the collectivity speaking through you? So that's important, right? Who's speaking? When I was little and I felt small and constricted, it wasn't me speaking. It wasn't my mother speaking through me. It was that large history that says, there is something wrong with your skin, it's too dark, and there is wrong, something wrong with your hair. It's so weird, right? So that does something to a person. And we must kind of look back and find who we truly are so that then we can tell our true story, a personal narrative that is landed in truth, in our truth. So, um, I'm not gonna ask you to do that, and I'm gonna ask you to do this, but we're gonna talk about the Taino people. How many of you here know uh, about the Taino people? Okay, good, good. Oh, 
Isabel, you're doing good, good work here. <laughs> Many hands went up. So they were descendants of the Saladoy people who moved into the Lesser Antilles and the Caribbean from the Orinoco River. So we are travelers. <laughs> we are also people of the water, right? We're always, the water element was very, or is very important for the Taino people. And um, they brought ceramics and agriculture to the Caribbean, as well as their religion based on Semis. And Semis were helpers um, in the culture. If you want to bring it to the Christian, I guess the saints were the Semis. Um, but when the colonizers came, the Tainos, as in many, many other regions, had a very sophisticated system of religious and agriculture. And that's when we have to think, how can people who were really connected to the land, who knew herbs, who knew how to heal themselves, how can we buy into this story that the colonizers brought illnesses with them and extinct everyone and killed everyone. That doesn't make sense. So what happens with the Tainos is that they went up to the mountains and they went into caves and protected themselves. So I was sharing before that if you go to the Dominican Republic and you go visit these caves, what you see is like this little opening in the ground that you don't think there is nothing there and you have to really squish your body through and then you go there and the whole world opens up with the Taino Mundo. A mundo that was not killed, that was not eradicated. And that is important. People cannot be killed cannot be eradicated. What we do is we change perspectives, shifts, we do things, and I'm, I'm gonna share a poem that speaks to that, but you cannot say these people was extinct. And how many in this country, how many tribes have you heard that they're extinct? or that they don't exist. They do. The people who were in this region, they moved running away, right, from the attacks of colonization and merge with the Abenaki, right? They, they merged. They didn't disappear. They were not killed. So we need to think twice Tainos were matrilineal, the society, the status, name, and property were inherited from one's mother and grandmother. So we came, the belief is that we came from Jokahu, and this is my Jokahu, the symbol for um, our great God is this. Can you see it from there? I put it against the black. That is Jokahu. And Jokahu had a counterpart, an ally, that was Atabe or Ataveira, the goddess Ataveira. So we came as a people. We came for, from the strength of these masculine and feminine deities. And as you know, we are all made of that energy. You don't have Jokahu or Atabe in you, but you have male, female energy. It does not matter where you come from. That's the reality. And that is strength. That is wholeness. So one of the things that I um, ask people to think is this concept, and maybe you in your little communities can um, work on things like that, this concept of rematriation, 
which means back to Mother Earth, a return to our origins, to live, uh, to life and co-creation, rather than patriarchal dest destruction and colonization, a reclamation of termination. So that we say, do I have seeds at home? Can I plant these seeds? What are the plants in my area that might be in uh, danger of being extinct? And begin sharing seeds with other people. You know, so many times, you know, as a psychologist, I hear people, oh, the world is so terrible, and what can I do? There is so much to do. I'd rather do nothing. I hear it almost daily because the world is scary these days, right? But we can do small things like taking this idea of renitration and saying, what are the seeds? And if you cannot plant literal seeds, ask yourselves, what ideas can I plant? You know, at the university where I teach, you know, South um, um, in New Mexico, in the Southwest, when the students, this is a PhD program in visionary leadership, and when they start working, the invitation is that they start planting seeds. Every project is a seed that they plant, right? So they're not literally planting seeds but their ideas are seeds, right? So there are very simple ways for us to stay connected to the reality that the world is not a almighty God, but there is an almighty goddess that is always there germinating. So, Again, I already said that the genesis of the Taino people can be traced back to the union of the god Chocahu, um, Pagua, Maraucoti, and the fertility goddesses Atabe, Germán, Guapar, Apito, and Suimaco. And I say that with a full mouth because if you read many of the um, history books, they will say, you know, they try to really um, bury the power of the goddess. But in those times, the more names you had, the, the, the greater your importance was. So I'm not poo-pooing, <laughs> um, I'm not saying anything bad about Jokahu, but he only had three names. <laughs> I'm just saying, <laughs> and how many times, how many names? Five, right? So I'm just saying, if you have read anything somewhere about Oh, that's nonsense. The proof is in the history. So the Great Mother, the Supreme Goddess, she was worshipped as a goddess of fresh water and fertility. Again, the elements were very important or are very important for the Taino people. But the water element is paramount. She represents the earth spirit and the spirit of all horizontal water, lakes, streams, the sea, and marine tides. Uh, we have Guavan Sex, which is um, the goddess, the supreme storm deity, um, also known as the lady of the wind, responsible for the onset of violent storms, which means she is the one in power of regenerating us. So when things were not going right, she will come with all her force and destroy everything to force us to recreate, to regenerate. So she is a goddess of great importance and she is represented in this figure, like kind of this S um, figure. 
um, you know, the, the, the wing. Um, she was not seen as a malevolent deity. Again, she was the regenerative force. And I don't know if you agree with me, but boy, do we need her these days with all this craziness and all these unnecessary killings that are happening in the world right now. She needs to come. And I think she did in a way. Don't you think the coronavirus was a little bit of that? Like, you people are like sleeping. Let's wake you up. And what happened? What did we see with the coronavirus? We saw all the injustices. Did you see it? Who was dying? Who died the most? Black and brown people marginalized people. So we were asleep. We were not realizing that. So these natural phenomena sometimes happen for a reason, right? To regenerate us. That makes sense. You think I'm crazy? <laughs> no. You better say no. Yeah. You should have said no. You're a nice person. <laughs> so um, quadrant sex works alongside three assistants: Quatriske, Gutaba, and Huracan. Um, you know, notice the, the the proximity to Hurricane. And these minor deities were responsible for heavy rain. Thunder, lightning, and hurricanes chronologically. Each of them could be devastating on their own. When working together, they force us to regenerate. So again, have they gone away? No. Every August in the Caribbean, something happens, some kind of commotion, and it forces us to regenerate to rethink, to rebuild. I'm not making this up. So the other goddess is Itiba Kaubaba, the great bloody mother, Mother Earth, or the mother of the four twins, and that's a whole history that I'm not gonna tell you, but it's an important one. Died of multiple childbirth while giving birth to the four twins. She is represented in uh, icons made of stone or earthenware shaped as a bulky trunk with her hands placed on the belly, right? Because she's the great mother who keeps giving birth. And again, people who are close, who live close to the earth, they know, they find manifestations of this great mother in so many ways, in the way that plantations um, uh, give or not give at a given time, right? If uh, Itiba Kaubaba is in a bad mood, <laughs> then there is not, um, not many things to, to harvest. When she is in a good mood, then you have a lot to eat. Mama Hikotea is another one, also known as Kaguama, the mother of the human race. It is said that she came out of the swollen back of Deminan Karakarakol, and Deminan Karakarakol is one of the twins that the other goddess gave birth. And actually, Deminan Karakarakol and his twin, his brothers, were the ones who created the sea and the fish and everything in our, um, in our creation story. And um, so I'm gonna leave it there because that's a long story. Um, so it is said that she later copulated with the four twins, the grandchildren, and um, then procreated the human race. Something that the Hikotea meat or the Tero meat the, the, was sacred and not eaten by the Tainos 
But that is like some people say, no, that's not true. They ate it and we're still trying to figure out. Um, again, remember the Tainos um, were uh, passed down their story through um, orally. So a lot of the things were lost. And then Fray Ramon Pané was the one who wrote, he was a priest who came with the colonizers, he was a colonizer, um, a, a spiritual colonizer, and he was the one taking notes and writing most of the things that we know about the Tainos. But the thing is that he was writing it from uh, the eye of, of a, you know, someone who didn't know the culture and didn't know Arawak, the language. So God only knows what he was hearing and translating and how he was telling the stories, right? But um, when I was doing my research and I went to the caves, uh, the beauty is that a lot of the myths that he tells in his book, you can actually see in the petroglyphs, you can see the stories, um, like clearly. You can you can go from point A, like the especially the 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 genesis of the Taino people. In one of the caves, you start here, you have this figure, and you can actually see the whole story here. So he wasn't totally off, but a lot of the things he was filtering through his language. One of the things that um the colonization did get away was with our language, the Arawak language was literally destroyed. However, there is a group, and I think you have Jorge Esteves here he's at the coming, university. Yeah, he's coming on November 20th. Okay. And he'll be talking about this project. Yeah. So Jorge Esteves, who is someone who has worked for years, over 30 years, with the Smithsonian Museum, he had traveled to other Arawak nations and with a group of um, linguistics and all other um, assortments, he has been able to reconfigure the language. So I'm not going to say more about that. He'll come here and he'll tell you everything that he has done, but not all is lost <laughs> in that sense. So the other goddess is Guabonito, and um, she was the goddess stones. Again, we, the Taino people, believe in the power of everything in nature. So the mountain was a sister, an aunt, a grandma, a tree is a relative, the stones are relatives. So Guabonito was the goddess of stones. And um, they were called sivas in Arawak. And stones, we see them like unimportant, but she healed people with the stones. She will take people into a cave and heal them with stones, right? So if you go to the countryside in the Dominican Republic, you're gonna see how um, sacred stones and rivers are for people. That is not just, you know, El Rio is there. No, it's, they're our relatives and we owe to take care of them. And because of that, so many, I'm not gonna talk about this. Um, she's not only a healer, she's also the keeper of treasures. The guanines, guanines were um, made of gold. And you know the whole thing about the whole motivation of the Spaniards when they colonized was they, they just wanted the gold, right? So um, she safeguarded the guanines in, or the, the gold in the caves. Um, yeah. So that's another beautiful story, her connection with Guajayona, someone who she saved. And to me as a psychologist that represent the integration again of the male, female. I'm not gonna bore you with that. 
And um, that's it. That's all I want to say about that. And then I want to share some poetry with you. Is that is that okay? Yeah. Or are there questions before I share the poetry about what I say? Is the same story because it appears to be um, very similar like La, um, La República Dominicana in Puerto Rico? Oh, it's the course. same. Yes, the yes. Same. I mean, it's, it's the, the same map. map. It's the same map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I can relate. Yes, yes. yes. We were, it was the same. Cuba, Dominican Republic, yeah. and Puerto Rico is, is like the, the same, same history, the merging of the Africans, the Tainos, who really, really unified and resisted against the colonizers. So it's a very similar, even the, the architecture, everything is, is very similar. So we literally, I can literally say we have a family mountain. You know how that is when you yeah. one has family, you yeah. build a home right yeah. on the mountain. Yeah. Um, and we lived alongside the tiny Indians. Yes. But as kids, when they would come out, as you mentioned, from like the mm -hmm. anywhere is within the mountain, it, the the respect is we don't look like we don't we mm -hmm. don't we turn our backs, mm -hmm. you know, and let them be. Mm -hmm. And it's all it was only the elders mm -hmm. who were able to maybe communicate because they didn't speak their tongue, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but they communicate through practice. Mm -hmm. Different practices. practices, yeah, yeah. And the thing, the important thing in Puerto Rico, right? Um, who are the Hibaros? The Hibaros were mostly the Tainos who went up to the mountains, right? El Hibarito lives way up in the mountain. Yeah. So we do share the same, the same history. Yeah. Yeah. As Haiti, as Isabel said when she introduced Haiti. Mm -hmm. um, was the island of Kiskeya, and then colonization parted us in two, and it's been a bloody, bloody history. And I'll talk to that through my poems. Because one of the things that, you know, poetry has been my salvation. Um, that's why I use it as a therapeutic uh, means. And I offer it to people because I know what it did to me as a little kid. And I started writing very, very young. And I that was my voice. That was my um, way to affirm myself. My first book was published when I was 18. So by age 18, I had a name, meaning I know who I was, right? And no one was going to tell me I was ugly or I was or, or else I will pull a poem <laughs> and defend myself. <laughs> so the way I see poetry is healing and it's also a way to reconcile story, to retell, to re-envision history. It's a way to look back. So what I tell people, I write a genre called historical poetry. So um, when I was doing my dissertation, when I was doing field work, and I was horrified, the more I read, the more horrified I got, because that was genocide. You know, basically, it was, there was genocide that happened. What was not true was the, the, the myth of extinction. Mm -hmm. But the genocide happened, and people were killed, and they had to run to the caves and the mountains to save themselves. So that's destabilizing, right? And what helped me, what kept me going was my ability to read something or to go to a site, then to sit in silence and write about it. And I have done that with, you know, whenever I have encounter or approach the history, uh, the African, um, history, the genocide of African slaves that began there, and then the way that they were transported, and then the way that they were treated, right? All that, I've been able to kind of metabolize it through poetry. So I'm going to um, to read, um, first I'm going to start 
with the poem. Um, I hope I am really trusting on Jorge Esteves to really help me learn Arawak so I can proudly read my work in Arawak. But right now, um, I have to um, appeal to the language of my childhood, which was the language of the colonizer, Spanish. And I'm gonna read a short poem in Spanish first, because that's the language that I grew up and after I speak a lot for a long time in English, my tongue begins to blah, 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 blah. <laughs> And then a good way for me to rest it is to read something in Spanish. So I'll do that. It's a very, very short poem. Vida en el museo. And don't worry, I will read the English version. Vida en el museo. Me fijo en las figuras. Estos cuerpos están vivos. ¿Por qué viven? Viven para mantenernos vivos a los muertos. So it plays with this idea, you know, every time I go to a museum, especially in Spain, where they stole or have things and they have these fancy museums there. So if you want to know what about the Taino people, you have to go to the land of the colonizers. And it's the strangest thing to enter those places and to see your history, your people, they are petrified when you know that we are so alive and well. So, life in the museum. I examine the figures closely. These bodies are alive. Why do they live? They live to keep us, the dead ones, alive. So short poem. So I'm going to follow with a poem that merges the Yoruba, the African, and the Taino um, together. And part of the revision of history and how I work with the poetry, like I took Christopher Columbus's diary of navigation, and I just like I really I tore it apart, and I retold the story in any way that I wanted to, because he had, he was a crazy guy who didn't know what he was saying, so I can say whatever I want. So, this is one of the, of the entries from his diary. I, so that they will trust all of us, because I knew there were people who will convert to our faith with love, and now by force, gave him some red berets and some glass stones and many other worthless things. Wouldn't you be angry if you read that? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, they were so bobo, so stupid. I just gave them a little things, colorful things. And then I appeased them and I didn't use force, right? So in his version, the genocide was the peaceful war. Can you imagine a peaceful genocide? Ay, ay, ay. So here is my poem. In the lie of red berets, the silky black pretends its disappearance. Later on, it comes out for air in the miracle of the kinky texture of the African consolation, or tune inhales us with divine force. Ochun is a goddess from the Yoruba tradition. In the fragmentation of glass, we seem to succumb until we discover the magic of stained glass, filtering the hard rays of the grand sun. In the spacious vortex of cathedrals, we fly, Pray the Holy Father in order to sing to Yokahu. In the background of the Holy Mary undulates Akabe's ethereal and fluid figure. The island herself from time to time seems to coil up in sadness. Her body, a bloody river, moistens the grand sun. That is why 
our dusk are so beautiful. In the roots of the yoga, the goddesses and the gods keep on making miracles. Kaguama protects us in her untamable conch. Even in these days of beaches colonized by tourists, playful and calm people, we play under the colorless skins of the saints to protect our golden feathers. So, writing that poem felt really good. And every time I read it, it feels really good because it reminds me of how we were never extinct. Not the Africans, not the Tainos. We are alive and well. Are there questions before I keep reading? So I have to read this poem and um, I really appreciate that you brought those quotes back to us. Mm -hmm. And that particular quote says a lot. Mm -hmm. And and it's it's you know we're all we can all read our own story in there, yeah. uh, or or we can read it our own way. Yeah. Right. So for me, like that quote, one of the things it says is the idea of what is worth. Yeah. You know what is worth, like you know, and still today, mm -hmm. the many ways that we are told what we're worth and what we're not worth. Yes. According to somebody else's mm -hmm. criteria. Yeah. Right, it, it's it's a tradition of of invalidating people by with this system of what's good and bad and what's worthy and not. Yeah. So that's and, one of the things I read into. It. Yeah, and so the, I appreciate that that part. Yeah. Of it. And the importance of decolonizing ourselves <laughs> and our beliefs, understanding. Um, you know, I'll be right with you. In the Dominican Republic, for years, especially in the um, nine, eight, actually, eight, 70, 80s, 90s, the um, industry of tourism really kept the country alive and it still does. And we were indoctrinated with this thing sonria al turista, smile to the tourist. Doesn't matter what they do, right? We have a tradition of Europeans going to the Dominican Republic to exploit little girls, really purchase them. That happens still to this day. So with this idea, and this is when we don't understand how colonized we are, when we were telling people, sonria al turista, but who was the tourist? Who were they? They were not brown, they were not black. Right? So perpetrated. I'm just saying. Okay. I have a question about um, your erasure book with the poem. I'm your erasure book with the poem Erasing Books and about the public journey. Uh -huh. And what other Caribbean writers did the influence you? Maybe mm -hmm. a lot about um, we talked about tourism especially. Mm -hmm. We talked about um, all this stuff. I have a poem yellow, particularly. Like mm -hmm. we talked about being yellow and color and how yeah. Yeah, I mean, so many people, um, I mean, Cesar is one, right? Like someone who really put all the, <laughs> the dots where they belong. Um, uh, Nancy Morejon from Cuba, I'm just going to the contemporary people. Um, Mayra Santos Febres from Puerto Rico, you know, still alive and doing things and revolutionizing the, the world and decolonizing us. Um, Mateo Morrison from the Dominican Republic, who I consider my literary father uh, because he really uh, baptized me in uh, the literary world and guided me and other women and um, someone who was not afraid to say, I'm black, 
and I'm proud, and his work is just phenomenal. So the, the, there are many, many other people. Uh, you know, Diaz, uh, his work, he's putting it out there for us to, to know the right way. Yeah, other questions? Yes? How to access the resources? Is that yeah, your question? I have some resources like there's this um, cognitive technology called Learn Go Strong that yeah. has some um, some representation of some authors who are, yeah. who are um, writing about and drawing about creative history yeah. and the you know, how courage is used in strategy. Yeah. So, uh, we'll see what yeah. So I think in terms of that, um, Jorge Esteves, who Isabel is bringing here, is a good resource. He has a whole community, actually, uh, on Facebook, and they are teaching the language as they develop it. Uh, Irka Mateo is someone who also um, has some online presence, and people, I think it's every Wednesday, night that she has an event that people can join and she um you know does um, a lot of ceremonies but the work also in terms of resources um the work of uh well my work is out there and my thesis is out <laughs> there and my articles are out there um but um the, the the work of also Edwidge Tantica, who is a Haitian uh, writer, and she also kind of travels between the 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 black ancestry and, and the the indigenous. Well, Balak is also indigenous, but um, so that's another um, resource. Yeah, but also you know the the other thing is bringing the students, finding the resources, bring them to see these caves, to see this reality, that these are things, again, th these are not made up things. This is, yeah, there are places like that in Puerto Rico too. Yeah, exactly. So, does that answer? Uh, kind of? Yes, absolutely. Towards. Yeah. In terms of resources, to yeah, you know. And I just want to say something. As your as the librarian, uh, we can do a one on one because there's there are some useful resources that I've come across. So um, if anybody is doing any kind of research in any of these things, you can always ask to meet with a librarian and, and we can exactly. work with you. Or take her class. She's offering an awesome class here. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah. So I'm actually from the Dominican Republic. You are. Yes. Or, mm -hmm. I was born and raised in Aurora, Florida, mm -hmm. and I was born and raised in Santiago. Uh -huh. So most of us are really are like white. Mm -hmm. And I feel that um, I never really truly learn about our Latino culture. Mm -hmm. And I have never noticed until now how close I am to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, so much. Mm -hmm. Like in my little pocket, we were literally. There you go. And, yeah, I mean, I still care about the water. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Because I don't know, like in VR, it, like in because of what I was like born and mm-hmm. raised, it's kind of like all about it. And mm-hmm. now I feel that it's not clear. It's like um, I'm already far away from like this point of mm-hmm. like, my people back then. Mm-hmm. So now I'm really like, trying to like like fit in with everything. So I'm not like so near. Mm-hmm. And now I'm just like too eager to get close and learn more about yeah. it. So my question yeah. for you is um, if you ever struggle to accept your um. I, I didn't actually, and I, I I think I thank my mom for that, because my mom is a true Taina, even though if you ask her, she said, what? Why? It's like, wow, those, those people were dead, but she in her way, right? So I was very connected, and I had the privilege also of being born in the countryside, very close, until at the age of 10, I was there. Right. And actually, as Isabel said in the presentation, it's not, it's not a, our toys were going out and digging and we will find these Taino figurines because when the, the intruders came, they buried most of the things to protect them. So the whole Cibao region, you can dig out caritas, we call it caritas. So those were my toys. Mattel didn't exist. Mattel is the, the, the company that brought all the, 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 the dolls and the Barbies to us. They didn't exist then. So we had the caritas to play with. And I was very close to that. And, and always felt very close. And very, I don't know, I think it was my crazy uncle I was talking about before, who was a storyteller and was always telling us stories, right? So... I know about Lemba, Sebastian Lemba, who was an African slave who united forces with the Taino and resisted colonization. So those were my references, and I was very proud. So you know, if you're Dominican, that the colonizing happens from our hair to everything, right? And I was the kid who would not allow anyone to put any chemical in my hair, right? So I didn't want that. I was always Pajo Nua because I knew that, that that was who I was. So that made a big difference for me. Um, I think that the, um, I'm from La Línea Noroeste, the, the Northeast um, region of Guayubín, and that's a very, um, a region where the, the Tainos and the Yorubas were very alive. So, the, the, you know, it was in the way of living of the people. So I didn't have um, that much of a struggle with that. Um, like I said, very at first I was like, oh, there is something wrong with me. And then I just, and that's how I started writing poetry, actually, because I wanted to talk about and I wanted to say I am, and poetry allowed me. Now, did I affirm myself and my blackness the more I investigated? Absolutely, absolutely. I will never forget, when I came to this country, I had two books already published, so there were people who would write about me. And I was at City College at a Dominican conference, and uh, a white guy from the South, I can't even remember his name, this was so long ago, this was in the 90s. He came up and he had written um, an article about my work and he approached me and said, you know, as a black person, and I remember feeling like, huh, right? Like, even though I've been celebrated, Right? And then I was like, oh, I have work to do. Mm-hmm. So those things exist, right? Like it's, it's conditioning, mm-hmm. right? And that's why it's so important to examine history. To examine how history impacts us. Because there was a part very deep, deep, even though I have written all the poems, 
friends and everything. That was the part that was like, huh? What? Where, where are you calling me? That makes sense? Other questions? You look like you have a question. No? Okay. Yes? I think aside from just the history in our um, culture and traditions mm -hmm. um, and the way of life, then is also the conditioning of, you know, when I think of many of maybe the elders who are like, oh, you know, we refer to like you know, mm -hmm. the faith like with yeah. for a better life. For a better life, right? Yeah. And so there's a make there's a lot of truth to that. Mm -hmm. But then here we are, the kids, the fifty three year olds, we're like, mm -hmm. why? Mm -hmm. we're, we're we're trying to go back, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's like the what's so you know, it's almost like what's good but what's the better life? And yeah. fast forward today, this is a holistic movement. Yeah is what our elders were living and mm -hmm. still are up in the mountain mm -hmm. is what everybody's trying to get to mm -hmm. but it's the very thing that they thought wasn't good enough or yeah. worth enough and wanted to do yeah come to the states right i mean for for in many families in the dominican republic and i think this is a caribbean thing yeah the french caribbean and the english caribbean and the spanish caribbean the idea of marrying into white to improve the race, that's real. That's conditioning. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Like, maybe that's the thing that I went like, like there was a moment, like it contradicted my own writing, yeah. right? But I went the feeling, and I can't deny it. I can't say I didn't feel it. It happened. And it made me examine myself. Like, what are you doing, girl? Like what? Right? So then I went deeper and deeper and deeper. Does, does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Now, the good thing is, there is a beautiful movement in the Caribbean, the whole Caribbean, mm -hmm. is acknowledging the afro -Taino. And that's good. That's very good. Other comments? Yes, I feel I'd like to share that um, as faculty director and some of our teams here, I'll sit here, uh, we are starting a Taino Winter Study Abroad program. So we're doing the groundwork now. We're going to go to Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico. And we're going to study Taino cultures in those three spaces. So we're trying to launch it for the next building. It's very open. And then in Spanish and Portuguese, we can teach Latin language, which is always. Afro Latino literature and also indigenous Latino literature. Beautiful. You have a lot of resources right here. So um, I'll read a few more poems. Yes. Is my friend lost? Uh, I didn't understand that much. Oh, ah, okay. So um, yeah, read a few more and then we can break up and um, you can people can buy books okay. from you if they want and they can sign so you can okay. have fifteen minutes. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read a poem that I wrote when I was about eighteen, I think, and is the most anthologized poem. It's probably not my best poem, but I think the message, what it says, um, that's why it has picked to be studied the most. The black belly button of a bongo, and a bongo is a, a drum, a percussion instrument. And this is, um, you know, again, going back to this idea of favoring whiteness in my country, my paternal grandmother was, I think, second or third generation Spanish. And she was racist like hell. Can I say hell? You're you're recording. I just said it. Mm -hmm. And um, she wasn't kind to my mother because my mother was a negrita. So this poem plays with that. The black belly button of a bongo. The blue 
eyed grandmother, blue black ears used to tell tales of boogeyman. By the way, the boogeyman is black. Of black boogeyman, stories of embroidered linen, white sheets, virginal sex, secrets of pots and beans, magic wand to cook good fortune. I lost my crystal slipper in the dust and the prince did not soothe my bruises. Later, it was all about cactus, not to lips. In the time set for war, grandmother, your stories slid down my skin. Black, not to gain ya, grandmother. Woman, not doll, abuela. Thunder came and lightning frayed the island. It was the drum. Cynical laughter bursting in curls. Tough curls fighting chemicals, singing kinkily and happily in the air. Black, mellow, majesty. I just lost my place. Dark, beautiful majesty. I stared in the eye, a wide and indivisible geography. Since then, I am a doubt planting questions. Sharp arrow is my tongue, the entire body. Before the rust, I found my voice, my eyelashes dusted time. I am a heroine in the jungle, grandmother. I see the night patrol, the palm trees, the fire, Yemaya with her belly made of water, the areito, chocahu, bagua. A little black girl prays for water, the bakini multiplies flags. The box of many colors. Did you forget it, Abuela? The hand close to my bones shakes a spring of twigs. Don't be afraid, Abuela. Lemba greets us, tiny. So that's an old poem with the, all the energy of an 18 year old. And it was written in Spanish. And Isabel Espinal actually was the first person to translate it. Do you remember that? Okay. <laughs> so, it, again, that was a poem that felt good to write. I loved my grandma. She was actually sweet in her own way, but she was wrong. So wrong. So glasses. She used to say, ¿Cómo vivirán los pobres? How do poor people live? Like, who says that? <laughs> In an island, right? But come on, Mama. Get it together. So it felt good to write it. It felt good to celebrate my I am -ness. Oh, how the Tainas are born. <laughs> how Tainas are born. I slip off the corset and hang in the air. Pendulum now, no one can touch me. I know the secret. They say I have died and come to my funeral. Winged, I escape from between the legs, the heads. I escape flying giving birth to a new life. They are mistaken. No one kills, imprisons, or traps me. Loose, as they say, I celebrate who I am and who I will be in the next moment. I sing with a voice they say had no music. I am essential music. I dare them to live in the spirit. Detached from life, I give myself to it. Pendulum, I swing anchored to the root. That is my secret. 
I escape flying from between the legs, the heads. I give birth to myself mid-flight. One with the wood, I swing. They come to my funeral, not knowing it is a birth. Swinging free from the corset, I am always one with the root. I said it. <laughs> so poetry for me is a way, um, a fascinating aspect. If you think about poetry, a good friend of mine, John Fox, who wrote a beautiful book called Poetic Medicine and another one, Finding What You Didn't Lose. He says that poetry is wisdom distilled, right? What we do in poetry is like we concentrate, we encapsulate big things, a lot of things in a few words. And that's the healing power of it, right? So I found, oh, I can really retell his story and I can make it short. So I can just pass these caps really fast. So I just pass to you. So I thank you for listening. I thank you for your questions. And I thank Isabel for the invitation. And I think you were also instrumental of this invitation. So thank you. Thank you to all the departments that contributed to make my visit um, a possibility and I love this place and that's it that's all I'm gonna say